Hey, everybody. Welcome to the wonderful world of Remnant Radio. In this program, we're talking about Mike Bickle, once again, uh, specifically the kind of scandal that took place there at the International House of Prayer. You guys stay tuned. You are watching The Remnant Radio, a crowd-funded show where we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. My name is Joshua Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we want to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. I know this is an overdue program. Uh, It's one of those things that we've all been waiting for, Uh, I think, from the very first moment that this stuff hit the fan and we were kind of roped into it. Um, I'll tell you, it has been difficult. I mean, no, no, it's not been difficult for us in comparison to all the people who've been out there experiencing that at IHOP, the church that's experienced that, the victims above all else who've kind of gone through um, not just the abuse, but even going public after the abuse and then having kind of Christians lob grenades at people who are already victims. It's been uh, kind of a disgusting uh, whole process. In fact, we went through and filmed a bunch of interviews. Um, I think we interviewed six and and we had people who had removed their name from the list of people that we're actually talking about today. So we've got Alan Hood, Joel Richardson, Sam Storms, and Jono. Uh, they're all, uh, we interviewed, talked to, uh, engaged with. We, uh, we've spoken with uh, investigative journalists and um, also, um, Mike's personal assistant, uh, but for other reasons, are not going to go public with some of those videos just yet. So, uh, Michael Miller just called in, which is great. Um, uh, Roundtree, how are you doing over there in Oklahoma? Doing good, man. Doing good. So, I'm used to saying I'm excited about this show today. I'm not so excited about this show today. Um, but, you know, we need to do it. We need to do it. We had, uh, some we, we've interviewed Bickle several times in the past and mm-hmm. we've done the prophetic history and so we'll have some comments on that for sure and people have been asking about that for a while but uh anyway so today's the day so we'll talk about that and um it, so it's an important show it's not an exciting show but it's important and I uh, do want you guys to know though kind of to set aside this episode for just a moment right after this episode uh, uh, for our Patreon subscribers, I'm going to be doing a live Q and a, so make sure you stick around for an extra hour and, uh, I'll stick around with you and we'll do that live Q and a. So, uh, Miller, have you joined us yet? Or are you still trying to join us? Uh, is, I'm here. I'm so sorry, you. guys. I, I was know. running late on the meeting that you, and, uh, uh, got confused in the time. Started so. three today? What'd you say? You, you hopped in the, you hopped in late. So I didn't know if you forgot. <laughs> Well, no, no, I was confused on the time. I'll, I'll, but I'll explain later. So, okay, all righty. Well, so, so let's okay, jump so in, Josh, let's where do you want to start? Jump into it. We've got a bunch of videos. We're gonna, we're gonna uh, plug uh, in. We, these are clips of interviews that we've done. So, like I said, interviewed uh, Alan Hood, uh, Joel Richardson. We interviewed Jono uh, from the Advocacy Group. Um, and then we also interviewed Sam Storms. Uh, all of these interviews are going to be found on Patreon. Um, not again, not trying to use this as something like, Hey, you can go watch all these full interviews. The the thing is, is we want to take clips. This would be three or four hours long if we did it any other way. So, um, what we did was we, we dumped the whole interview up on Patreon. It will publish today at 7 PM. Uh, so, uh, those interviews, if you want to watch all of them are going to be over there. Um, but you'll get a good gist of that here. Uh, we took clips out of their answers to kind of compile. Uh, I think we're going to start off with when you first heard about the allegations against Mike Bickle. Uh, some people had, you know, seen some writing on the walls. Some people didn't see this coming. Some kind of had a weird mixture of the two. Um, so we're just going to kind of walk through. I think it's important for our discussion today to think of these people as the white blood cells of uh, IHOP. Everyone that we interviewed is IHOP um, in, in the relation to like Sam worked for the school and and then Alan Hood worked for the IHOP side of the school. And then, you know, Jono has been a member and super involved and Joel Richardson attended like was like part of the first semester of students uh so is jana so like they they are as ihop as anyone is ihop they have led in that community and they're the ones holding um the elt and their feet to the fire frankly so as much as we uh, can view this as ihop versus the advocacy group man it's ihop and ihop um it's people inside uh, the movement who love the movement care for the movement and are calling 
uh, repentance. So I'm I'm proud of these men for stepping up and doing interviews with us and talking about it because they're going to get flack for it, guaranteed. So let's dive into uh, some of our first uh, clips. These are long and pre-recorded. We will give commentary after each section. So if you're like out there going, man, how much longer are, are these uh, talks before we break in and kind of chat about it? They're you know anywhere between three and eight minutes each. So buckle up. You know the dissonance was there's two people of high character. That was the dissonance. When she called and she began to share, I knew what she was saying was true, although I didn't want to believe it. I just wailed. It was this cathartic moment. I believe I was one of the first that she called so that when she did, we both found ourselves literally wailing on the phone. I had to, I pulled the car over on the side of the road and just wept with her for the longest time. And I knew, I just knew everything had changed. <laughs> You know, um, the world as I knew it had just changed and my worst nightmare had just been presented to me, but I didn't have the dissonance that she wasn't telling the truth. I begged God that it wouldn't be true. I begged God that, you know, maybe she has some mental instability, but I actually have walked with her for over 20 years and knew her to be a person of integrity and character. And so the dissonance was, is, this is who I've, this man whom I've experienced. And now I'm finding out there's a hidden side that I could not have dreamed of. And I'm shattered at a heart level. It became very personal to me um, very quickly. And I was just shattered. I think, you know, I, I think at looking back, some things were beginning to leak out over even the past three or four years, yet she wasn't, I, I, I think she had a moment where what she would define as the shelf broke, where she could not compartmentalize anymore, where she could not take, where, where the spiritual manipulation and the keeping her close and the favor that she had with Mike was, the distance was too much. And she finally, the shelf broke. She told her husband she, that on her 20th anniversary, can you imagine her 20th anniversary? She finally gets yeah. honest. What took place she calls her best friend and then within the next month she calls me and at that point i'm getting on a plane to israel for the next two weeks and i just stare at the sea of galilee and the temple mount and life is horrible but i, I want to say this she began to share in measured ways her pain as she got as she began to uh, get more confident in what she was sharing as people begin to respond to her, it's a very natural process what she began to go through. Even with some of her family, um, I began to encourage her to meet with her family. And over the next two months, she probably shared with maybe a dozen couples, you know, where she was, she was just broken beyond measure. Where do you go from there? How do you begin to walk this out? I, after I've gone through this now, I have no judgment on victims whatsoever, how they do the process. You know, somebody said to me, how could Jane Doe have told 12 different leaders and their couples, let's say she went to 50 different leaders. Well, at the same time, my dear spiritual father, Mike Bickle was preaching on false accusation and all using the prophetic to set up this environment of self-protection. And he was doing it on live web stream to a million people. And so I said, look, you, he, he was doing that as she was beginning to share. All these things were converging at once. And I found, I look back on the process and I see her as having courage, beginning to talk to leaders who very well have could have rejected her, but to their credit, they begin to hear her, more things begin to emerge. And then over a process of literally months, she began to wrestle with, am I going to confront? And um, on October 9th, her husband uh, decided that he was going to confront Mike and begin a, a formal process, Matthew 18 process, by the way, which isn't relevant to this scenario but was being opposed, was being imposed upon her by some of the IHOP Casey leadership at the time. You have That's to right. do 
speaking, you have to answer to our eldership. And um, it was a it was a misappropriation of scripture, but to their but they even submitted to that and began to walk through that as well. I, I had heard from one of the members of the AG that allegations were coming. Um, I didn't know many of the details. I heard just enough to know that it was legitimate, probably toward the end of September. You, did you just say um, the, uh, you mean the advocacy group, right? Yes. Okay. AG means Assemblies of God in my head, and I, it has to mean that to another viewer, and I had to make sure that that was clear. Go ahead. Not to be confused with the AOG, but the advocate group. So one of the members of the, the core advocate team, advocate group, um, told me. And so I knew things were coming, but interestingly enough, um, uh, I also, right around the same time, uh, had invited a friend to go out and get breakfast. Um, and I say a friend, really, it was just an acquaintance, a guy that was um, turned out to be one of the key whistleblowers. Um, and uh, look, his name's really not a secret, and you, you guys are going to interview him. But um, you know, he was a guy that was hanging around the prayer room. Uh, he had a season of real um, prodigal, uh, you know, walking away from the Lord and going out to L.A. and partying and this sort of thing. But he had come back. He was really, um, again, just a dude, uh, you know, a dude like me. But, you know, he was struggling and, and, and really doing a good job of, of trying to push, pursue the Lord. And I thought, this is the kind of guy I just want to get with and encourage. And so we were sitting down. We we're just talking Saudi Arabia, this and that. And it was kind of like, I know about this stuff that's coming with a, uh, with IHOP. And he was like, yeah, I kind of know that stuff too. And I was like, oh, you do? And and then we both kind of laid our cards on the table. And it was like, oh, my gosh, what I know and what you know are actually two totally different things. And when he shared this information with me, I'm a very fast adapter, um, and especially seeing the big picture and knowing what was going to come. And I thought to myself, they are going to destroy this guy. They are going to ruin this guy's life because I know that the reaction is going to be to cover up. And I said, this guy needs friends. He needs people to stand with him. And so he shared the story of another very significant um, occasion of clergy sexual abuse, a relationship with another um, uh, sister that's been part of the ministry. And so all of a sudden I was hearing all these different things. And again, that was probably that was in October. And it was all right around the time that I was also speaking at the School of Messengers again with uh, Sliker, Stuart Greaves, and and Mike. So it was all, yeah, pretty much within weeks of it all, um, all breaking. Now, in terms of when I came to the conclusion that they were covering things up and not doing things right, it was almost immediately. So again, because I have a little bit of experience with some of these issues, um, and and look. The body of Christ has learned a lot over the past decade with all these ministry scandals and and so forth. And I think that these are lessons that we need to learn. If someone made a lot of these mistakes a decade ago, it's a lot more understandable. Um, but now today, either if you make these mistakes, it's because you haven't been paying attention or you haven't been learning what the Spirit has been speaking and teaching to the church. And so when everything broke... Um, Again, it was right in the midst of me having just spoken with Dave and Sliker, and I said, I want to see what they do in terms of an announcement. So with regard to the night, the evening that Dean Briggs got up and said, this is BS, you know, for those that are tracking with this kind of the, that infamous night. I was so proud of Dean Briggs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but Stuart got up and the announcement sort of tagged on to the end of a few other announcements was like, we're aware of the allegations against Mike. Please don't use the black horse prophecy. Like it was the most, um, uh, what's another word? What's a synonym for just horrific? Um, egregious. I, egregious, yeah. I was going to say half. But um, I texted Stuart and I said, look, Stuart, I said, that was unethical. Because I was trying to see how they were going to respond. And... I texted him and I said, I want to be clear, Stuart. I think that was because what he was trying to do was say, like, I did my due diligence. I did what I was supposed to do while pretending and appearing to be doing the right thing, while clearly not doing the right thing, while avoiding doing the right thing. I look, I informed everyone. No, you didn't. Ninety five percent of the people in the room were like, I have no idea what he's talking about. We are aware of the allegations against Mike. 
That was literally what he said. Please pray for the Bickle family. So I texted him. I said, that was unethical. I cannot speak with you guys next month. I cannot share the platform with you next month. But if you're willing to meet face to face, I'm happy to do that. So that was on Saturday, the night. Um, and then I, I guess this was a week after everything when Mike gave his black horse prophecy. So I went up there and I sat there probably for two hours with Dave and Stuart. And, you know, like I'm a straight shooter. Uh, I just said, guys, let me tell you how this is going to go down. They said in a year or two from now, it doesn't almost doesn't matter what Mike has done. He's still going to have a small band of supporters. He's going to have plenty of financial supporters. And I said, but you guys get your lives destroyed. You guys get thrown under the bus. If Mike digs his heels in and denies the allegations, you guys get your lives destroyed. And it's not fair. I said, unless you do the right thing. I said, the horrible job that you've been given right now is you have to quickly, swiftly execute your spiritual father. You have to take him down fast. Otherwise, he's going to destroy this community. He's going to tear families apart all on the altar of his own reputation. They're, he's going to sacrifice everything on the altar of his own reputation, his fake, right, his fake image. And um, I said, they said, well, what do we have to do? What's the right thing? And I said, you get up tomorrow. There's already a social media firestorm. You get up tomorrow, you say, we are aware of, and we very seriously take the allegations being made against Mike seriously. We are calling for a third-party investigation. Give us you know, these things take a few weeks, give us a couple of weeks, but we will do so. We will take our hands off the wheel, full transparency. Please pray for us. Please be patient with us. I said anything less than that and you guys are done, period. You don't have any other choice. And, you know, I don't want to make them out to be total evil scoundrels because they're very complicit, but they're also victims. You know, they're under the spell of Mike Bickle. And I said, guys, if you're not, if you can't admit to me right now that you're under his spell, you're delusional. I said, I live 15 minutes away. I haven't been this close to him all these years, but I'm under his spell. And I said, even if there's 3% doubt in your heart, that's enough that's going to cause you to delay, that you won't be able to do the right thing. You have to do it. You have to save. The only thing that saves IHOP the only thing that saves all of these families is if you do the right thing. They looked at me, kind of smiled. And the next day, Stuart got up and he said, everything other than we are calling for a legitimate third party investigation. And let me just say this too. Let me just confess, um, because if they watch this, they'll be like, Joel's not telling the full story. I go, guys, I get it. It's hard. I said, I'm not a big fan of Boz Chavidian either. I said, I think sometimes he can be a real jerk. Um, and I want to just say, I, I apologize for that because, look, he can be a hard nose. Uh, you know, he can be a tough, he can be a bulldog. But the reality is you have to be a bulldog to do what he's doing when you're coming against these organizations, which often act corruptly. And so in the same way that I repented for um, questioning some of Julie Roy's tactics, the body of Christ needs Julie Roy's. The body of Christ should be thanking Boz Chavidian. And so I just want to say that, um, you know, even right now, but... The bottom line is the next day I went to IHOP and I watched. I was there with Tracy Bickle and, you know, all kinds of different people as we stood there and watched. And Stuart got up and he fumbled the ball. And I walked out of there saying it's over. It's it's already too late. He's already ruined everything. So that's that's a bit of the, uh, the back story. Yeah, I was in a very close personal relationship with Mike from 1993 to 2000. I left to go to Wheaton College for four years. When I came back in 2004, again, I was present in the prayer room for the next four years. And then of course, very close to Mike in constant communication, visited him many times uh, until the day that these allegations began to emerge. Now, let me make it very clear. I never saw anything that would lead me to believe he would, could be capable of this kind of sin. Um, I was in a group with, there were four couples um, and we were uh, together every other week for at least two to three hours, sharing our lives, praying for one another. This went on for several years and I would have never suspected anything. In fact, I, that's precisely why I wrote such glowing um, articles defending Mike and his integrity and his character and his ministry, because I only saw um, the example in the life of a man who loved Jesus, who was true to the word of God. Uh, I honestly, if you had asked me before all this broke, Who's the, only, who's the one person that you know that 
would never in your mind be capable of this. I would have immediately said Mike Bickle. Maybe John Piper after that, but certainly Mike. It, it was a complete shock. I'm gonna. I, I don't think I've ever shared this publicly. It's interesting what the Lord Im, kind of indelibly imprints on your memory, and you can't shake it, even though you don't know what it means. I can remember in the late 1990s standing on the front row of the church with Mike and the original Jane Doe, the one that he was involved with for 97 to about 2001. She had just come to Kansas City. She was standing on the platform as part of the worship team. And I remember he kind of turned to me with this really interesting grin on his face. And he said, isn't she cute? These young girls who worship the Lord that way. Look at her face. Isn't she just adorable? Now, why would I remember that? Yeah. In itself, I don't guess it was necessarily an inappropriate comment because she was, she was a very attractive young lady. But for, for some odd reason that has stuck in my mind. And when all this came out, that's why I instantly concluded. I yeah. think I know that Jane Doe is aside from that, Mike's life, his teaching, his commitment to prayer, to holiness, to the authority of God's word. I, I would never have suspected him. I never saw, I never saw anything overtly. Um, I never saw him flirt. I never saw him um, touch women in an inappropriate way. Now, I've heard since then from a number of individuals who said that he was a little bit handsy with certain in, uh, certain women, but I never saw it. That's what makes this whole thing so baffling to me. Um, I was first contacted on August 2nd of 2023, and the leading member of the what is known as the advocacy group called me and he said, Sam, there's some problems in leadership at IHOP. We need to talk. And he began to unpack the story to me. And honestly, I thought, this is nuts. You have you, you can't believe that. Mike would never do that. And um, he said, well, we've, we know a Jane Doe who has testified very clearly that these facts are true. And I said, well, until I can talk to her face to face, I'm not going to believe this about my friend. And uh, within a week, they connected me with her. And I knew her. I kind of, honestly, I'd kind of suspected that she might have been the one because I knew the young group of girls that Mike used in the early days of IHOP who did research for him. And so I did a long two hour zoom call with her and her husband. I heard all of the very unpleasant details of their interaction over a span of three to four years. And I saw no reason why I shouldn't believe her. I, I believe her to this day. I think she's very credible, a very godly woman. It's very pain. She stood to, to gain nothing by this. She stood to lose a whole lot. So that's kind of how it came to my attention. And then from August up until uh, the end of October, um, I was in constant interaction. I did probably 12 to 15 two hour Zoom calls with everybody associated with this. Um, witnesses, alleged victims, Jane Doe's, um, you, you name it. And so it kind of immersed me in the whole uh, investigation, even though I really didn't want to be a part of it because I didn't have any authority at IHOP. Um, and I thought the executive leadership team there should have handled it. But unfortunately, they didn't do a very good job of handling it. So I felt somewhat compelled to step in. And that kind of culminated at the end of October. Um, I think it was the 27th or 28th when um, everything kind of came out publicly and a statement was released by the advocacy team accusing Mike of these things. And then I said, I've got to go up to Kansas City. So I got in my car on October 30th, drove to Kansas City. Francis Chan and I had been in communication. We decided to hook up together. We got together uh, on Monday night for, with several others for a long Zoom call. Tuesday morning, I emailed Mike. I said, Francis and I would like to come talk to you. Now, the interesting thing is, on the drive up to Kansas City, Mike had called me and he was very angry. He said, turn your car around, go back home. I'm not going to meet with you. I'd never had him talk to me like that before. And I found out later as he confessed that apparently someone had lied to him about my participation with the advocacy group. When he realized it was a lie, he apologized. He said, OK, you and Francis can come to my house at four o'clock on Tuesday afternoon. So I somebody questioned whether or not I showed up unannounced and the answer is no i i've got the email that mike sent inviting me there he did say something very interesting and and frustrating in the email he said i'll meet with you as long as you do not interrogate me but listen to my story 
And that was a red flag to me because I thought, Mike, if you're innocent, why wouldn't you say, look, I'm an open book. Ask me any question you want. But I didn't push back on that. So Francis and I showed up at four o'clock, rang the doorbell, and Chris Reed walked out. Very well-known individual, operates in prophetic ministry. I think he leads Morningstar Ministries now. And Chris said, well, Mike's in a very important conversation right now, and he can't meet with you. And I thought, well, it's interesting. He's meeting with you, and you've known him for two years. I've known him for 32 years. But we didn't put up a fight. We talked a little bit. And then Francis and I left. Uh, Mike sent me an email about an hour later saying, sorry, couldn't meet with you, but I've been told not to talk to anybody. And then he said, don't email me again. That was hurtful, to say the least, of a very close, intimate friend. Francis flew back to San Francisco the next day. I drove back to Oklahoma City. Week passed, and I thought, I can't abide by that. So I sent him an email, and I appealed to him in it, Mike, please. Please, the only way you're going to preserve your name, reputation, and have any hope for ministry in the future is if you stand on that platform at the church, on your knees, confess your sin, uh, every one of them, not hiding a single incident, repent and ask forgiveness from those you offended and hurt. And I said, Mike, I'll stand with you, my arm around you, if you'll do that. I never heard anything from him, haven't heard a, 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 a single syllable from him since. So let's just kind of start off with this piece because we have, I mean, you heard in that in those clips in those videos, um, people saying their personal relationship with Sam, their inability to even see, I'm sorry, Sam's uh, relationship with Mike, Joel's relationship with Mike, and Alan's relationship with Mike, and how they were even unable to conceptualize how Mike could have done something like this. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about that. I, I know on our end, we have... Uh, quite a bit. We'll talk about prophetic history later on when we have those sections of videos. We talked on Remnant Radio about prophetic history. And this is part of this show where I feel the responsibility to take responsibility for the things that we've done. Um, we, under good faith and expectation, listening to Sam, listening to Mike, uh, were convinced that, hey, um, this is a story worth telling. Um, look at what God did. Uh, we're going to champion this. Woohoo. Way, way to go, God, trying not to make a big deal out of IHOP per se or Mike or any of the other uh, so-called prophets surrounding that situation. Um, and I feel like we have done nothing but make that more popular. Um, I feel like we've put gasoline on a fire to some extent so that more people could have been hurt or targeted. Um, I, 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 We couldn't have known, well, I think certainly, but at the same time, like I feel, I feel somewhat responsible for that, and I feel like we have to take responsibility for that. And I, yeah, I, I apologize we, to our audience for that. My my desire to have those videos removed as soon as this stuff, as soon as I found out about any of this, which was right before those statements were released, was largely because I thought he used those things to groom people. That's right. Uh, he he used those videos to groom how many uh, SA victims, and he used those videos or those that prophetic history to groom people to come and to buy into his vision where more people would get abused. And I wanted nothing to do with that. And so that's why we removed the videos for those who ask. Um, but I'd also say, I'm sorry. Wish we had yeah. known. Yeah. Uh, I really do. Uh, yeah. I, I think, you know, we'll still get criticism from those who don't believe that prophecy happens today. They're going to, they're going to say, no, well, no matter what you're, you owe more than that apology. Biblically, I can't get there. Uh, I can say there are such things as false prophets, and uh, and I can also say I don't know how much of that prophetic history is and is not true. What I do know is what Mike Bickle did with it was egregious, sinful, and wrong, and for that reason, yeah. I want nothing with it. That's right. Yeah, and uh, I'll join you all on that. Uh, guys, I am sorry for recording those videos um, on the prophetic history. So I think that... Um, you know, they're, you know, stories of these angels and these predictions of dates and so on. Uh, I, I think we were just, it's exciting to hear about cool and powerful things God is doing and, uh, or has done and to retell those stories. And I think there totally is a place to tell stories of profound activity, supernatural activity, like there's a place for that. But 
Uh, what I realized later as I just really thought about, it, I, I think it, it kind of goes a little bit with the warning that Paul gives the Colossians about being inflated with visions of angels. And certainly there were lots of angelic visitations in that. And, uh, it, it, and, he's, and Paul says that like you become detached from the head, from Christ. And, and just when I think about like how much of that prophetic history was really aimed at building up the movement, the movement. In fact, personally, I don't actually love the label, the prayer movement. I'm really glad that houses of prayer are cropping up all around the world. I think that's a beautiful thing. Uh, but when people use that language of movement, like, oh, this is this is not a denomination, it's a movement, oh, the prayer movement. And then when you attach prophetic revelation onto that, it puts a level of importance on someone, in this case, Mike Bickle, or something, the ministry that he's built. And, and I think sometimes it's like, uh, I, I mean, I look at the seven churches in Revelation, uh, five of them get rebukes. The only two that escape a rebuke are one that has a little strength or a little power and the other that has a little money. And I think especially like the American in us, those of us who are an American audience, we think bigger, better movement, powerful, all this kind of stuff. And when you attach prophetic phenomena to that, it gives this inflated sense of importance. Like I'm part of the billion soul harvest and I'm part of the next big thing that God's doing. And I just want to tell our viewers out there, what if you're not part of the next big thing that God is doing? Think about what Paul says to the Thessalonians, make it your ambition to live a quiet life and work hard with your hands. Like what if you just go out and swing a hammer real well and uh, make a living for your family or change some diapers and invest in your children? What if you live a super just quiet and ordinary life of love and you do your best to make disciples? It's like Count Zinzendorf said, preach the gospel, die and be forgotten. And, and I think that this movement because of the prophetic history it became a magnet that pulled young people in from all around the world. Um, and and it's not that I believe the prophetic history, like my guess is there was probably some of it that was true and right and accurate and some of it that wasn't. But I feel concern about a leader. Uh, and and now I, I didn't feel it as much then. Obviously, we did the videos and, and so I'm sorry. But um, I feel concern about a leader saying, follow me because I've had grandiose visions. Um, yeah, I, I, that's where I think the mistake was made. Yeah, we've got so we've got an entire section where we're going to address specifically prophetic history. So I want to make sure that we kind of reel you guys in, so we don't do that part now. Yeah, we um, need to comment on that. We need to comment on section. that more, uh, a lot more on the prophetic history. Um, I'm jumping uh, ahead. Sorry. No, it's okay. It's okay, man. We're all chomping at the bit. There's so much that we've been we've held up. We've pin like been pinned oh, up for two months, three that months. We've been to talk yeah. about. Um, and we've been kind of aware of a lot of the happenings of what's been going on. Um, so it, it's, it's something that we, we've got to remember acts. Uh, I've been, I'm, I prepped for, you know, first Timothy from I'm going into first Timothy with my church. We're doing verse by verse and, um, acts 19 and 20, Paul is in Ephesus, right? Well, in 19, he's in Ephesus three years. He's there in the synagogue, Halotranus. Then he goes on these missionary journeys and he sends forth the elders from Ephesus and the elders from Ephesus meet him at Miletus in Acts 20. And he starts telling them like, hey, guys, just so you know, from among you will come wolves. Like he didn't say from among the church of Ephesus will come wolves. He pointed to the elders and he said, from among you will come wolves. So like as much as as much as um, these videos have been kind of helpful. OK, yeah, yeah, Mike, he did some bad stuff for sure. Like I just I want this to be kind of a wake up call for the body of Christ to like burn this whole honor culture kind of leadership that doesn't question our leaders in any way that looks to the elders of the church and says, well, they're not capable of doing this. Um, you don't want to be in a system where you're under the spell of your senior leader and things can't be questioned and, and things can't be challenged. Um, we need to be able to have a system within charismaticism um, that I think allows us to take the scripture seriously that from among the elders of the church, wolves would come in. Um, and I think we have to have some more self-awareness um, and, and, and be discerning and judging of things. And, and again, at the end of the day, 
um, there are churches who are, um, they've got the best policy in place, right? They have the best ecclesiology, but, but if you're good at hiding, eventually it'll come out. Um, but, but man, uh, people can be really, really good in convincing and compelling when hiding their sin. Uh, Ravi took it to the grave, right? Uh, Bill Hybels, um, it wasn't until late on in ministry before people started figuring out and putting two, two together. Um, time and time again, these cases, sin, sin comes to light for sure. Um, but we should never assume that our leaders are not capable of this kind of um, yeah. sin uh, that is egregious. Well, so. Ju- Judas did all the same miracles that That's all right. the other guys who were sent out to do, and yet he was a betrayer, and only the Lord knew it. The rest of the guys who had discernment of spirits didn't know it, which tells yeah. you we just don't always know until after the fact. Yeah. Now, regarding some of the the past videos, I want to comment on some of this. You know, we asked Alan Hood about dissonance. Was there cognitive dissonance when Jane Doe came and told you her, her story? And what I love in this moment is Alan Hood, who's been a big IHOP guy. He was on the inside. He believed her story. And what I find to be often the opposite is when a person brings an accusation against a leader, um, there's always that thing that gets said, well, we've got to believe the best. But it typically only gets applied to those leaders and never to those who bring up an accusation. Why didn't we believe the best about those who brought forward the accusations, which is what yeah. happened with the LT, which is what Joel also mentioned. He said they were under a spell. They're disqualified to evaluate what's happening here. And the truth is they were groomed and handpicked for those positions. And so on some level, they became sort of perpetrators in, in shoving facts and removing facts away from the limelight. But then secondarily, they were also chosen and groomed in that way. And they're victims at the same time. Um, hmm. Michael, you were going to say I love something. that. I, yeah, I think that's powerful, Miller, because like, I mean, it's first Corinthians 13, love believes all things. We want to believe the best about people, not the worst about people. But what tends to happen in large ministries is just like you said, we believe the best about the leader or leaders and the worst about the, you know, about the victims. And, uh, and so really like we, we just, we, when, we did our episode on IHOP like two months ago, three months ago, whenever it was. I remember quoting the statistic that 95%, I think it was roughly around there, it was in the mid 90s, I think, uh, 95% of uh, accusations brought forward by whistleblowers of sexual uh, impropriety or abuse by clergy are accurate. And of course, like, you know, certainly there's a Joseph who gets blamed for Potiphar's wife. And like, certainly there are such a thing as false accusations. And we have to be aware of that. But 95% is a big number. And, and I, and I think that it's important that like, you know, for IHOP to come around like, um, months and months after everyone else knew, like he's guilty. And then like long after the fact, be like, yes, he's, he's guilty. Like, there is something to be said for like, you, you need to be reasonably early in your adoption on this. You know what I'm saying? Like it, it doesn't really do you any favors if like when, uh, when everyone else in the world sees it, that you finally say, okay, I admit it's there. It, you, you track yeah. me with me here? Totally. Yeah, totally. of course. And, and I want to, I want to fill in some blanks too. Joel Richardson mentioned someone um, who he had breakfast with, I believe, or lunch with. And uh, it was in this interaction that, that there was two separate stories from two different women um, that kind of came to light in that meeting. That other individual who he said, oh, you're going to interview him, we did not interview. Well, sorry, we did interview them, but they requested that the video not be shown uh, for the very reason that Miller and Roundtree are both talking about. Um, when people went forward, uh, there's been a lot of attack. There's been a lot of uh, character assassination, um, intimidation, people showing up people's jobs in, in workplaces, um, harassment with their family. I mean, wild stuff has taken oh. place. Uh, so out of request uh, to not share that interview, we chose not to share that interview. Um, it is because taped, the- it is filmed, but we're not we're not doing anything with it. The, the fact is that those who whistleblow end up getting the worst of it. Um, mm-hmm. always, uh, I'm, I'm literally in the midst of a whistleblowing myself. I have a whole group of people that have testimonies and they're all terrified of their name being exposed. 
they're terrified of what that abusive leader will do to him uh, when he finds out that they have a story to tell and that they're willing to tell it. And so uh, the other thing I was going to say is when, when Joel talks about that team um, being under his spell, uh, that's usually the case of an eldership team, um, whether it be a plurality of others, whether it be uh, a board of directors, or you, you go on with it. If you've got an abusive person at the top, um, most often that team doesn't see it or they would have pointed it out a long time ago. And so they're usually not going to be the ones qualified to evaluate the accusations that are being brought forward. Um, yeah. That's not always the case, but that's often the case. And there was a reason why people were saying this needs to be a third party investigation. The ELT was hand chosen. They could not evaluate it. And, and again, it's no shame against them for being unable to evaluate it. It's the fact they were too close to it. They couldn't actually hear the accusations and trust the people bringing them forward. Um, they yeah. had to be, it had to be somebody else. Yeah. Right. I loved what Joel Richardson said where he's, you know, he's telling the guys like anything less than this is going to destroy you. Uh, you've got to call unequivocally for a third party investigation, commit yourself to transparency. And then he said like, you know, if 10 years ago we were making that, those, these kinds of mistakes, it may be a little bit more excusable, but now like we've seen it again and again, transparency wins the day transparency wins the day and you know miller and I, you and i have been talking uh we've talked about this a lot that like the, the third party investigation feels i think to organization leaders like the big boogeyman oh we don't want that but like if you don't have anything to hide it's just like it's wonderful like and and even at, like i mean for one it's huge for public credibility like a quick willingness to have this um but uh but two like Hey, a wise man loves correction. Like we should want people to speak into us and like someone from the outside to your point, Miller. And I, and I just think those are some of the things that we've learned in the last 10 years. I like the way Joel worded, like, this is what the spirit is saying to the churches. And, uh, and I, and I think in the past, like just the big churches, the big organizations more easily got away with abuse. There wasn't social media. There wasn't all this attention. If it wasn't for all these armchair quarterbacks, so-called, which man, I hated that. Yeah. And I, I, I want to end on this note because we've got so many more clips to walk through guys. Um, let, I want to end on this note. Think of these people as the white blood cells of IHOP. Every single one of them we just talked to, Alan Hood, Joel Richardson, uh, uh, Sam Storms, uh, Jono, who we're going to interview him. What's Jono's last name, Miller? All. Paul, thank you. I was is escaping me. I kept saying his Your first name. name. That was last name. You don't need a last name. So, so no, your yeah, first name is Jono. You don't need one. That's right. You don't need a last name. Uh, but but all of these guys went to IHOP. Members of the church went through the school, led the school. Leaders in the community wrote forwards for each other's books. Were at each other's conferences. I mean, these guys are as IHOP as anyone. Which I think doesn't doesn't do any like i'm not trying to defend ihop by any stretch of the imagination i'm just saying look at godly men and women and what they do um no one right now looks at those men and says oh you know um their integrity is in question we're proud of them we champion them and if you're in a situation and you're in a church where abuse seems to be taking place at the top be these people be like this be like the ones who are banging the drum and saying this is wrong and I'm going to lose friends and it's going to hurt and people are going to criticize and people are going to uh, you know, try to demean and discredit and they're going to come after me and my family, but it's right. Because at one point in time, you're, you're going to have to stand before Jesus and give an account. And I would rather give an account on behalf of those who we protected and not the image of this thing that we tried to build. Um, anyway, I just, I just want you to have that in your mind because yeah. if you're seeing or hearing things like this, um, just remember, these aren't a bunch of outsiders. These are insiders. Um, at least that's my two cents on it. Yeah. Um, okay. No, You're go pulling ahead. up the go clip, ahead. so I'm going to say one more thing. Uh, <laughs> don't destroy victims or alleged victims. Don't destroy whistleblowers. When, uh, when Joel said, like, man, they're just going to destroy this guy, he mentioned his prodigal lifestyle that he had repented of, that he had turned from. He's mentioning it because he's thinking this this guy has credible evidence, but it's not going to be listened to because of a past lifestyle. Like that's shameful. It's shameful oh, the way we go dude. after witnesses, whistleblowers, and victims as though 
they're the problem and safeguard and protect people in power. And I, I, I've been reading this book by Dan, Diane Lingberg, psychologist. And um, one of the things she says is the way that we respond to the weak and vulnerable exposes our own hearts. I think that is so true to the scripture. Um, the scripture are consistently saying, look for the weak, look for the vulnerable, look for the hurting, uh, look for the outsider, look for the voiceless and be their voice. And um, unfortunately, the body of the Christ too, too often does the opposite. All right. Well, we probably got to watch. Oh, more do I get another point. thing? Well, I, I saw that you had another thing. Do you want me to? Well, me... I, I, I just remember when I when we did the fired from the NAR episode, one of the things that was said to me because I was a whistleblower or said about me was, "Oh, this is just his daddy issues coming up again." You know, you know his his dad left when he was a kid. It's like, dude, that right there, this pastor who I had confided in and talked about the issues of rejection and abandonment, used that to discredit me when I called him out for sin. And this is what always happens. The ad hominem arguments are always the same. They're just bitter and wounded. Get ready. The moment you try to expose sin, that's what you're going to hear. So, and that's what's happened to these guys. That's it. Okay. We're going to dive into this next set of clips. Uh, we've got red flags, uh, a couple videos on red flags, a couple videos on prophetic history, and then what we can learn from all of this dumpster fire. Uh, this is uh, John O'Hall. Yeah, I mean... You know, uh, I think I've said this on, on Twitter that um, I, I, I did ultimately leave as a matter of conscience um, in relationship to how a, a, an issue was dealt with of another gentleman who um, had sexually abused a 14-year-old as a twenty mid-20s youth leader in a church. Um, Mike and I had a kind of a, a big disagreement about that, but... Um, but looking back, uh, Mike was in a position of a father and a leader. Um, and a lot of us were, I mean, it's like kind of our age with the, the next kind of level down. Um, and there was a lot of things that I, I've looked at in hindsight that you would have like, well, that's weird, but that's just Mike. And you're like, but I wouldn't have said that to any of my other colleagues. I would have probably like, hey, let's have a coffee. What's going on in your marriage at the moment? Because what what is happening there? That that doesn't look good. Um, and I think um, we we have this kind of celebrity culture in the church. And I think that certain people are a little bit of a step above. And so the the, the question I, I've always got in ministries now is, can um, can somebody talk to that senior senior pastor person in the senior pastor position? Can they speak truth to them and uh, and there not be repercussions, negative repercussions as a result of speaking truth? Because I think uh, definitely at IHOP there there is there would have been that that level of fear of like I can't can't go to that place with Mike because he is deserving of whatever honor he's deserving whereas i would have that same conversation with somebody on 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 my level um yeah you know uh, no uh, i was as shocked as anyone uh when jane doe called me in late june um you know holiness was preached it was happy holiness but it was christian hedonism you know it was very similar to what john piper uh, would be writing about but it was this sense of uh, focus on intimacy growing in holiness so that you could be closer to the Lord, um, fidelity in marriage. The marriages in the leadership on the leadership team were strong. And um, we now I, I do want to say this one qualifier. Mike was you didn't get close to him. I had a, a very good relationship with Michael Sullivan and Sam and their and their wives. But um, I would have never known Mike or Diane per se. But I never saw anything that would give me any red flags other than, you know, we can look back now and go, wait a minute. Was that a good reason to have locks on the inside of your door? You know, what, uh, 
What was that? Was that weird? I mean, how big was the the movement at the time? I, I, I the way I envision it is like early days. We're talking about a couple hundred people, and it's weird for I feel like a director of a school of ministry that you run to not have personal relationship with. I would assume the guy who's launched the thing. I would imagine you all worked in tandem. Um, is that did that feel weird? No, actually, I'm speaking more of the '90s. Okay, got it. Once I was in IHOP, I, um, you know what? There was a closeness because we were doing it so often. Okay. Mike okay. Still, still there, was on the same schedule as Mike. We did six to noon in the prayer room, um, five or six days a week. We were meeting all the time. If we ever went over to Mike's house, it was usually with couples. There would be three or four of us couples, usually weren't one-on-ones, but Mike and I developed a, a dear friendship. Um, he was always an international leader, and I was always just this 29, 30 year old who came on staff with all these young people. Now, granted, I would have been one of the oldest young ones, but the gap in age and ministry experience and notoriety and fame, all those things were so great that you always felt just lucky. You just felt blessed to be at the table and felt part of something that was emerging on the earth. And of course, Mike has a wit and charm that is second to none. And he has a childlike sincerity that you engage him easily. And so there wouldn't have been any red flags as far as me looking at his life and going, he has these moral indiscretions, this hidden sexual indiscretions that are going on. I would have never guessed it at all. If you would have asked me, what are some of his weaknesses? I would have talked about leadership culture I would have never talked about personal holiness. I I resonate with Mike Bickle as a teacher. I've always connected with his teaching style. But one thing that's always bothered me, quite frankly, is his lack of displaying weakness from the pulpit. Um, I've always looked at him and said, you know, I can never be as holy as he is. I can never be as committed as he is. I can never be Mike Bickle. I could never be Mike Bickle. And that's actually always bothered me. I've personally, as a minister, always tried to, probably even to a fault, wear my weaknesses on my sleeve, talk about my struggles, even, you know, can, I mean, look, you can always take these things too far. We hate people that, you know, overshare. Um, but, you know, I've even confessed struggles and sins from the pulpit and this type of thing. And, and so anyway, I have been aware of a lot of the um, <clears throat> social uh unhealth, a lack of health socially, because, you know, over the years I've seen, I've seen a lot of issues. I won't get into all those things. You know, one spouse that spends way too much time in the prayer room while the other one's struggling at home with the kids, uh, with resentment. I've seen marriages fall apart. I've seen a lot of these. I've seen the lack of, of healthy pastoral care, but I've always just kind of chalked it up to, well, that's not Mike's strength or this type of thing. They need to work on it. Um, Obviously, with some of the big scandals over the years, like the Tyler Deaton, Bethany Deaton um, death uh, and, and some of these things. OK, and it's a little technical, but in the midst of we were about to announce, we were about to go complete full disclosure and send out a statement that uh, Mansoor had had a moral failure. He immediately sent a uh, letter of intent to take legal action against the board and anyone who spoke to to sue us all as individuals and as an organization. Um, we learned thereafter that the board didn't have insurance. And the thing, Josh, with most board members, you know, I've sat on numerous boards is, you know, a lot of people, they maybe they're a successful business person or they've got some skills. They join a ministry board because they want to serve, um, but they don't often have a lot of experience. So, you know, you've got like a guy who's a farmer sitting on the board and suddenly we're on a zoom call and he says, I could lose my farm over this. Like what in the world? Because the last thing in the world you expect is to get sued by the guy that you've been serving and, and volunteering for free, you know, to, to assist in this sort of thing. So he had sent this letter to Sue saying that we're not allowed to send out a, a statement simply saying that he had a moral failure. And um, then one of the other leaders in the nation actually threatened to expose the names and locations of all of our underground church planters and disciple makers, which is just unfathomable. You know, you think, wait, these are Christians? Yeah. And so I've been out here in Kansas City for 30 years. 
I've never had a face-to-face, one-on-one conversation with Mike Bickle ever. And I've never pursued it. But you think, well, you know, you're Joel Richardson and, you know, you speak there, etc. But he's never pursued me until he heard that we as an organization were being blackmailed. Again, don't reveal this information or we'll, we'll take this action. And he didn't know the specifics, but he called me into a meeting. And this was my first one-on-one face-to-face conversation with Mike. And we sat down and he dug, he said, what do they got on you? You know, and he was asking me personally. And I said, like, really nothing. Like, I don't have any, I don't have any big giant scandals or skeletons in my closet. I'm a total meathead, Josh. You know, as I tell people, I swear way too much. Um, You know, there's been plenty of times that I've drank more, you know, than I should have socially or this type of thing. When my wife first got really sick. I was um, a couple months into it um, uh, without getting into all the details of how horrible it was. But, you know, I, I started putting myself to sleep with uh, a shot of bourbon, you know, and there was about two months there that I was really struggling and I've never been an alcoholic. Um, so I've got struggles, you know, but I don't, I've been married 28 years. I've never even flirted with another woman. Um, but he was digging, Mike was digging like, well, what, what about this? And it was, it was strange to me, uh, admittedly, but yet this was Mike Bickle. So I didn't go like, why are you digging for dirt? Like, this is unusual. I just thought we were talking. And I was happy to confess to him my weaknesses, my struggles. Um, and, you know, just happy, happy to have face-to-face time with him. And I said, but Mike, I said, isn't it the right thing to do, even if they're suing us, simply to go full disclosure? And he said, you're not obligated to your donors to tell them all these things. He said, again, he presents it in this very biblically oriented way. He says like, the best way that you can help Mansoor repent is to give him freedom to do so. If you force him by sending out a statement, it's not authentic, it's not the most redemptive way and all this stuff. And again, I I respected him so much that even though that really didn't make sense, I accepted it. Um, But then I, I sort of argued with him. I said, but it's the right thing to do to go full disclosure. And he said, You're not obligated to your donors or anyone to give them all this information. You're simply responsible to be faithful with their money, to do with it what they donated it for. And your responsibility is to care for those inside the organization and to take care of them, to pastor them. Now, that sounds really good. But really what he was saying is protect the organization, which is the exact thing that causes organizations to get in trouble. They try to protect the organization rather than being transparent and, um, and, and submitting themselves to the body of Christ, quite frankly. And then I said this to him. I said, but Mike, if we don't go full disclosure, because, you know, I said to him, I, I understand sort of the wisdom of what you're saying. I said, and then someone like a Julie Roy's uh, investigative journalist finds out, then we look like scoundrels. And this is what Mike said to me. He said, look, he said, most of your people that follow you they don't really like Julie Roy's anyway. He said, so you just don't worry about it. And if Julie finds out she'll write an article, you might lose 15, 20, 25% of your supporters, but you'll gain them right back in a year. You just keep moving. And I was like, that doesn't seem right to me. Like I actually was in strong disagreement with him, um, but I was gonna say the CEO um, decided uh, he was in strong favor of going full disclosure, and he's he's a former fireman, just salt of the earth guy. He has done an amazing job of walking the organization through this, and we have since then worked through all the legal issues and gone full disclosure, um, but it was a process. But I tell that story to say, this is Mike Bickle's mode of operation. Don't respond, don't go public, don't disclose, and if you get attacked publicly, ignore it, just keep moving. And people will continue to support you. They'll forget or this type of thing and move on. And that was, uh, you know, in retrospect, that was a very poignant um, encounter. Okay, so you can hear um, through those interviews the kind of red flags that have come up from amongst these individuals. Jono, um, you know, his stories of confronting issues but then not being able to have like a peer uh, only being able to call out peer relationship stuff that he saw out of bounds in that culture. Um, Alan also mentioned, yes, he didn't see it coming, but the only thing that he could see that was wrong was organizational leadership. 
Then you've got Joel Richardson, um, who came back on and talked about how he the, his red flags because he only had really one like meaningful interaction with Mike um, was when Mike was trying to get him to essentially cover up and ignore um, an issue that was taking place within his own uh, ministry or one of the ministries he's he participated in uh, in missions. So um, again. I'm just letting you know because we're at the hour mark. People are jumping on because you're used to our, num- our normal four o'clock show. Um, these full interviews where Joel explains the two kind of scandals that have gone on in ministries he's overseen informed him on how to handle this situation, but gave him a lot of processing up into this point. So I'd encourage you, if you're interested in some of those stories, um, the full interview is there on Patreon where he kind of unpacks all of that. I'm going to toss it over to you guys. Miller, do you have something you want to say? Uh, no, I just, that, that bit about, I mean, I have some stuff to say. Yes. Uh, the bit about, um, him being blackmailed and it, it, Joel being blackmailed and it being difficult to bring information forward. And then Mike Bickle basically telling him, um, no, it's not your job to do that. You just need to, to be faithful with the money that you're being entrusted with on the, for this organization. It, it, it just communicated so much, um, I mean, Josh, you and I had a situation where there was somebody we thought we needed to expose. And fortunately, that person displayed a great deal of repentance and was willing to to make restitution and make things right with those he sinned against. But do you remember that Mike pulled you aside? Do you remember what he said to you? Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I went up to the House of Prayer just to hang out for a week. Um, I didn't have a meeting with Mike. He just saw me in the room and heard about it and um, pulled me into a room. And uh, you can't you can't talk about this. It's you never go public. Um, yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I don't know. Like to your point, we confronted this person directly, kind of Matthew eighteen, and there was public repentance and uh, restitution when it comes to addressing the situation that is in question. Um, so it didn't need to escalate. But I'll tell you, I, I lost a lot of respect for Mike. Um, from that i'll tell you well it left um, us with questions it left us us with with massive questions after after the fact yeah for sure i just i think it at the time it communicated to me that's how this person believes about public exposure that's that's what they think and to be fair he wasn't the only one there's so many others that have hated on us for doing the uh prophetic reviews that we did in 2020 like the very first time it was like everybody thought we were just the heresy hunters uh, but yet we were the continuations saying no we love this stuff and for that reason we're doing this but there was there's always been this sort of hatred against those who might uh expose things and and and, and strong admonition not to and um now it makes so much sense after the fact um and I, I can't help but wonder when it comes to public exposure, those who say don't post on social media, don't uh, go on YouTube and do these kind of things. It's like there's that part of me that's now left with this uh, unending question of those who say not to do that, what are they hiding? Because it becomes very clear now that Mike was trying to hide something. Right. Yeah. Um, well, and I hate that that's in my heart now. Like I don't even want that there. I mean, what, what we're seeing here is this, I mean, this contrast between dark and lightness and how this plays out in a big organization. So John chapter three, Jesus says, those who love the darkness stay in the darkness for fear that they might come into the light and their deeds be exposed. So when Joel's talking about it, even lack of weakness revealed from the pulpit, but then to the story that you guys shared personally, as well as what Joel shared about like, hey, you, ne- you never go public and and so this is this is like the false notion that we as leaders in the kingdom of light will most thrive by keeping darkness in the darkness. No, 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 no. We shine light into darkness. Ephesians chapter five, it says, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose it. And in this context, he's talking about our role as children of light. It's very uncomfortable for us as I mean, it's uncomfortable for anyone to do this. I mean, I, it's, there's no pleasure in this. And I, and I don't think that it's like, hey, we need to go about like broadcasting everyone's sin to everyone. But persistent, unrepentant sin from those who will not listen when done privately, it does ultimately escalate to a public exposure. 
that's the flow of Matthew 18, where it's go with one person, go with two people. Then you're telling it to the church, and then you're excommunicating them. That's how it works in the church. And uh, and then in the parallel passage to Matthew 18, 1 Timothy 5, 19 to 20, this is the leadership version of Matthew 18. And it looks like, uh, certainly, Paul is borrowing from Matthew 18 to talk about how do we address sin in leaders. So Matthew 18 talks about two to three witnesses. 1 Timothy 5 talks about two to three witnesses. Uh, Matthew 18 talks about tell it to the church. First uh, Timothy 5 says uh, rebuke their sin publicly so the rest may be warned. And so these are drawing on parallels, and this is how you deal with conflict in the church. You first address it directly. You, you don't go public like right off the bat like, oh, he sinned. I'm telling everybody. No, that would be sinful. Um, but you do address it individually at first. And as it just escalates and the people are just not listening, there does come a point for exposure. And that's what you're supposed to do. Unfortunately, the way the church has built itself is so much of the this Mike Bickle approach and what he's displayed. And that is, you just, you just keep it all in the darkness. Well, for fear that it would be exposed. And it's just this, this false idea that if I just keep the stuff in the dark, then I can build the kingdom of light. And that, that is com completely nonsensical. It, it just it Let doesn't me work. So. Let me tie on the, the the back end. You mentioned the two witnesses. I wanna I wanna jump on this real quick because some would live under this this guise. Of, oh, I can't talk about it. I can't go forward. I can't bring this to an elder because it's only my story and I don't have another witness. The the quotation in like First Timothy five that talks about not establishing a charge against an elder by two or three witnesses. That is a source quote from Deuteronomy and it's case law. Um, in Deuteronomy 17.6, Deuteronomy 19.15, there are quotations of the scriptures in case law saying if there is just a claim that he stole something but no proof, there needs to be two witnesses. It doesn't mean eyewitnesses. Uh, a witness could be um, you know, a fingerprint at the scene of the crime. Like It could be a piece of evidence that is binding. What Paul is telling Timothy in 1 Timothy is to not give elders preferential treatment in the same way that every charge against uh, mm, uh, 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 yeah. uh, you know, a, a lay person in the church should be established on the basis of evidence, so should accusations against elders. Uh, elders don't get to be treated more harsh because they're elders, and they don't get to be treated less harsh because they're elders. The fact that they're elders means that they're a Christian, they're a member of the body of Christ, and these things need to be validated. So if you're, if you're in a position where you're like, I can't move forward with this because I only have one person that will come forward and talk about being horribly raped or assaulted or, you know, uh, ha having a, a person grope them. Like if, if that's if that's your reasoning, um, you you don't understand the text of Scripture. Uh, when it talks about two or three witnesses, if you got text messages, that's enough. It, you're just talking about proof. That's what this is talking about. Um, so I, I want to be careful that people are. Yeah. I mean, even in the comment section, are like, oh, well, you know, uh, they, they only had one witness and then these two people are talking and then it's, here comes another witness. And it's like, guys, that's how evidence works. Like that's stuff bubbles to the surface. Sin gets exposed. God mm -hmm. promised it would happen. So I just I want to yeah. I want to encourage yeah. people there's... who might be in similar situations. If you have an accusation of any kind, all accusations have to be investigated. You don't just wait until two or three or four women come forward. You wait for the abuser to like hurt more That's people right. so that stuff comes forward. Don't do that. That's you investigate beautiful. every charge. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and that's a good time to bring in uh to bring in a third party. You know, you have a, a an accusation of sexual abuse. Well, what the third party can do is you know because the, the organization is going to be afraid of that oh no a third party's coming in and it's going to look bad it's going to look like we're an abusive church well here, here's the deal if you bring in the third party this is a professional who can quickly one either validate the claim in which the very best thing to do is immediately act on it and take the third party's advice but on the other side what if the third party actually exonerates the person that can happen we talked about joseph and Pot potiphar earlier and so there, there are such things as false accusations that can definitely be true. And First Timothy 5, 19, 20 is trying to guard against that. But a third party can be a professional to help come in because let's be honest, pastors are not professional sexual abuse like uh, 
investigators or like people who can like really evaluate. I mean, you, you might have like some common sense or a little bit of training, but like bringing some professionals, their party can only do good. That's, that's, I think one way that would honor the spirit of first Timothy five, 19 to 20 without a wooden literalism that would require two or three people to be raped before you act on it, which is egregious. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, uh, do you guys want to listen to some of these prophetic history videos and then we'll give some commentary on prophetic history and how we're to engage and work through some of that. And then, uh, we can talk about what we can learn from this whole, again, dumpster fire. Uh, you guys ready to move on to the next thing? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Cool. That's what I'm working through. I'm not prepared to dismiss it entirely. I am going back and investigating. We asked him a question about the prophetic history, and he's answering that question for people that are like trying to figure out what he's talking about. Uh, the stories that can be empirically verified, that can be confirmed by eyewitnesses that obviously uh, could not have been manipulated or created on the sly. And differentiating those from the incidents that are based solely on Mike's testimony of his personal experience. Now, in saying that, I'm not necessarily saying that Mike was lying or fabricating. Um, my guess is that much of the prophetic history was very real, that God did these things and that Mike exploited them for the purpose of grooming young women and building a, a platform and an international reputation. That breaks my heart to have to say that, but it seems rather clear that, that he has made use of it in that way. And in fact, even lately, since this whole thing exploded, he's used it to somehow justify or exonerate himself from the charges being made against him because, uh, you know, the whole story of the black horse, which is an absolutely un, I'll say unbelievable, but is believable, fantastic prophetic story that uh, has been confirmed in so many ways. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to write a book called the rise yeah. and fall of the Kansas city prophets. And I'm going to go back and with a fine tooth comb, go through every story. I probably know the prophetic history better than anyone aside from Mike. And I have reams of material and I'm going to very carefully examine what we have confidence was really from God and what we now hold in somewhat a level of suspicion. And uh, I think, but you're right, Michael, we, we should not build ministries or plant churches on the strength of the alleged supernatural experiences and prophetic dreams of any particular individual it needs to be based and rooted in scripture and what the word of God tells us a local church is to be built upon. Very important yeah. distinction you just made. There is a world of difference between the legitimate things that God does of a supernatural nature and what we do with the things that God That's has right. done and how we make use of them, how we build a platform, how we enhance our reputation. So that's a very important principle. I still believe God does great and wonderful supernatural things, but I'm very cautious now more than ever about how, to, what, what use do we put them? How, how do we make, um, find benefit and blessing in it without exploiting those things that are early going to end up backfiring on us the way this has with Mike in Kansas city? Yeah, that's a great question. It's going to take the rest of the year for people like Sam storms, myself to wrestle through that. But the moment that Jane Doe shared her story with me for the first time and used that, Mike told me, Diane's going to die and that I am going to be in the chariot with him and be his wife. And she said he told me multiple times at that moment, now I'm faced with the fact this man will lie. This man will manipulate. Now it calls into question a lot of things and how could you use that prophetic story that's so key to the prophetic history and actually set Mike up in this position of untouchable prophet. Yeah, exactly. Because you're the one that's been in the chariot that's gone to the throne and you're the Lord's anointed. You're the one that God has sovereignly appointed. So it, that story alone put him in an exalted place that was hard for you know, 20 year olds and 30 year olds to a quest to question this global leader. And now everything's called into question with that. Now I I've been around the prophetic, um, for 25 years and I've seen the truth of it. And I know some of the prophetic people, um, that were part of that prophetic history that I've watched them tell me a dream I had the night before. And it, 
powerfully impact my life. I've watched words of knowledge be crystal clear and precise. And yet, you know, some of their private lives have been called into question. But when this happened with Mike, I had never seen him mishandle the prophetic up to that point. He He's very supernaturally natural, except the prophetic history to leverage the entire movement now at this point with that phrase, uh, it called it into question for me. Now, I, I'm a gospel preacher, so it's never played the role in my family. If I can't find it in the scripture, I don't care about the prophetic history. If I don't believe Acts 2.17, I really don't care about the prophetic history. I, I, I believe Israel's going to be saved because of Romans 9-11, to not because Bob Jones said it and that the prayer movement's on the earth. I, I don't believe in prayer because of the prophetic history. I believe in it because of the scriptures and because of church tradition and how it relates to revival. So in that sense, the prophetic history didn't do what wasn't the center of my universe, so to speak. But I can see once this began to unfold and Mike using a portion of the prophetic history for sexual indiscretion uh, was devastating to me. And immediately it's called a lot into question. We don't have time to do it here, but I want to throw something out at you because I still keep hearing my dear friends who are bringing up these prophetic histories as if they're going to still happen in some sense. Matthew 18 is very clear. When a brother has sinned and the church has confronted him or her and they are unrepentant, God has given the keys of the kingdom to shut down those individuals, that individual influence in the body, that whatever they bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever is loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven. And I just want to say this very clearly to my dear friends, IHOP KC World, and to the global prayer movement. Beloved, if Mike does not repent, the church will bind his activity on earth. And even the true prophecies, the individual prophecies, will be bound. They will not take place unless he repents and turns wholeheartedly to God. And that would be my plea now. My dear friend, Mike Bickle, repent. Don't just, don't, this is not about individual blood of Jesus. It's about make it right with the victims, their husbands, the people of God. Because if you imagine, I hear even leaders saying, He's going to be restored, this or that. An unrepentant sinner, the body will clamp down. It's called binding, limiting their access. And those prophetic stories will not come to pass outside of wholehearted repentance. I'm just talking the true ones. Many will be seen as not true. So I, I want to just say that the church will bind that activity and they will not come to pass. Um, before I toss it over to you guys, um, there's been a word used or a phrase used about restoring Mike. He can't be restored. Everyone's opinion is their own on this program amongst the three of us. Um, I'm not speaking for Sam or Joel or Alan or any of these guys. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, um, if I ever see Mike Bickle back in ministry, I will be telling people he is unqualified and should never be back in ministry. 100%. Full stop. 100%. So um, anyway, I just when when you hear the phrase um, restored, I hope that means and I, again, I can't speak for them because I haven't asked them. We didn't we didn't chat through it. I'm just I've heard it a couple of times right now. And I just have to be very clear as far as if if, if I ever see this guy back in a pulpit, back in a ministry, um, I will be very loud and outspoken about it. Um, that is you can be restored to Jesus. You can be restored to your wife and your family. Um, but you have to be above reproach and this reproach does not leave. In fact, you have, you've caused reproach on the gospel, not just yourself. Like you have, you have marked the, the, the movement of God, right. Uh, in the earth. And I think that's not right. a good thing. Um, yeah. And, so and I would say, history stuff. And, and I would say it's absolutely wrong to talk about somebody's rest. Like regardless of what one thinks of whether somebody who falls into that sin or those kinds of sins can be restored to a pulpit one day. Like even regardless of what one thinks of that, because I actually agree with you on that, Josh. Um, it shouldn't even be brought up. 
before they repent. Why are we talking about that? Like, I mean, when I, I hear Rick Joyner, like, I believe we're going to see Mike Bickle in the ministry again. And then, um, you know, Chris Valentin got in some trouble for comments he made, uh, I guess, a week or two ago about Mike Bickle. And uh, it, I'm just like, and I can't remember if he mentioned restoration or, or not. I honestly, it's been, it's he, been a couple of weeks. He did but what he said was awful. Right. I'll address it. it. It was just, if I remember right, it was more sympathetic. It was sympathetic to Bickle and didn't overtly express sympathy for victims. But, uh, but either way, why are we ever going to talk about restoration of somebody, regardless of what you think? Like, if they haven't repented, if they haven't repented. And I like how uh, Alan was talking about the keys of the kingdom for binding and losing. So that's Matthew 16 and Matthew 18. And, uh, it's not the charismatic interpretation of like, I bind the devil and I loose the holy angels. And like, it, it's not that it's in the context of church discipline. And, uh, and so like Hood, Alan Hood talked about binding one's access into the church. It's in the context of excommunication. That's the, the, the final stage of Matthew 18 in hopes of an excommunicating them in, to use Paul's language, turning them over to Satan that there might actually be restoration like Hymenius and Alexander and first Timothy 1 19 I handed them over to Satan that they may be taught not to blaspheme and so in handing them over in in binding them uh the, in putting them outside of the church they're under Satan's domain subject to the suffering that Satan would bring but it's with a restorative hope that's what excommunication is about and and I don't think that just like just because somebody like disappears from church, like if they're not on good terms, like there needs to be a formal excommunication. I do know, I mean, IHOP isn't a church, so IHOP can't excommunicate someone. That's the, the church gets the keys of the kingdom, not a parachurch organization. I know that IHOP forbade Bickle from returning to the property. I don't, I haven't heard of anything from Forerunner Church, uh, which I think is where Bickle went. Or whatever church he went to, like really, there should have been an excommunication. And just because somebody stops coming to church because it's awkward, Michael's opinion, I don't think that uh, that prohibits them from being excommunicated. Like I don't think you can just run away from that. I think that church leaders need to say, "We formally turn this person over to Satan, that they may be taught not to sexually abuse women and lie." And those kinds of things. Uh, what, what do you guys think of, of what I'm talking about? I know. I mean, I agree to all of it. Um, all right, Miller, go ahead. Oh, no. Josh, you're yeah. fine. Well, I'm just... I got I, something to say. I'm going to go in a different direction. So go Yeah, I was going to say we need to pivot on to the prophetic history stuff. I, I would say that the... on I've got a, a post. It's nothing special, but on Facebook um, about prophetic history. Um, you know, I live in a town of Ada, Oklahoma, and here in Ada... Uh, Oral Roberts was a young 17 year old boy who got healed uh, here and you could create a big grand narrative of how God wants to restore the healing anointing to Ada and you could like, you know, God's doing this new thing or, or get a prophetic word that Bob Jones gave you one time a long time ago about how the Kansas City Chiefs did this thing. There's going to be this great revival in, in Cleveland and all this other great stuff. You could build your church around that. But at the end of the day, the Great Commission is enough. Like, love God, love people, preach the gospel, make disciples, right? Great commandment, great commission. They set the vision and the mission for the church. You know, there are things that I feel like God's placed in my heart for my church, but I, I hold those things close to my chest. I, I hold them in my heart and I pray through them. And if they ever come to pass, I'll know that God accomplished them um, by his own sovereignty and his own hand, not because I was good at marketing. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think that pastors have tried to attach um, there, we all want to be a part of something that's like bigger than ourselves. Um, something that's grand, something that's important. And I think that these prophetic narratives and this prophetic history and this like prophetic, uh, these are the great things that we're going to do and, and things that are going to happen. I, I think that it is trying to attach itself to that desire in people to want to be a part of something grand. I don't want to be a part of a, a dead church, an old church, a, you know, this, this, you know, religious system. I want to be part of something new and cutting edge and what God's doing in the earth. And, and there's just like this desire to not be normal. Um, Joel Richardson, if you guys go watch all of these interviews, one of the best lines, he, I think it's one of the best lines in the whole 
you know, series of interviews we've done is he said when he was, I think in Bible school at IHOP, he, he said um, he went to go be a part of another church because he needed to be going to a church where not everyone was awesome. Like he just wanted to go to a church where like people were normal. And I think that that is a profoundly humble thing to do that it would benefit us all to just go to church um, and, and try to fulfill the great commandment and the great commission um, and not attach ourselves and others to a grandiose prophetic narrative. Um, when, when I honestly, man, if, if, if you don't want to like kick Satan's teeth in and preach the gospel and, and, you know, rob hell with, you know, saints that you're like populating heaven with, if, if, if that's not something that interests you, I, I don't like, I don't know what prophetic narrative I could give you that would make you more interested in that. Like that's enough. Um, anyway, so the, Miller. the the comment that Sam made was in response to a question I asked him about how prophetic history often gets used and how um, so much of this attaches to my own uh, past hurt and story. But I remember how there was this prophetic word that justified and gave voice to this specific specified vision of this ministry, which failed to function as an actual church, that the, the vision itself did this. But what happened with IHOP is it set the precedent, the prophetic history specifically of IHOP, it set the precedent for allowing uh, prophecy to dictate the vision of a church. Instead of clear teaching of scripture, go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. Now you've got this new vision that is unique and it's based on prophecy. And um, what I found is that this set the precedent in other churches. You go look at other other churches, other ministries, um, other prayer rooms in particular, they've always got some sort of unique prophetic history. And they even require people to sit through classes on their prophetic history. And so what they're doing is they're using this kind of prophecy to justify their unique place in the earth. And I think that's egregious because um, you've already been caught up in a story so much bigger than your own just by being a disciple of Christ. His vision is as big as it gets. It doesn't need or require some sort of pet vision that uh, that makes itself stand up amongst the rest of us. Um, being a part of the church is being caught up in this grand story. And I think that's, that's one of the other things that I'm realizing today, a lesson learned uh, from IHOP is, and their prophetic history is how it did that. Now, I, I do want to comment on... Uh, uh, Rick Joyner and Chris Valentin. Michael, you brought it up. It happens to be an area of great frustration for me. Rick Joyner's public statement of, I'm ready to restore Mike Bickle. Awesome, Rick. Um, Rick, are you ready to restore the victims? Do you have a fund set aside to help them? Why is it that you immediately rush to restore that leader, but you mention nothing about restoring those who've been hurt by that leader and the fact that that leader is unrepentant? Uh, Chris Valentin, this is going to be, and I, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing your name, but I'm addressing you in this because I listened to your sermon. And in it, your concern was for the fallen leaders who just didn't have a place to confess their sin without there being shame attached to it. And I'm going, wow, that's so, oh, so interesting that you were so concerned about Mike Bickle as a fallen leader. And yet again, where was your concern about all of these victims? Uh, even your apology falls short. You called him your friend when you should have been calling him by the name of his sin, which is pedophile and perpetrator. Yes, next time you say your friend Mike Bickle, why don't you add the other words that go with it? I'm I'm personally just very frustrated with how that becomes the main point of concern and not for those who didn't have power. So yeah. this is about as impassioned as I'm going to yeah. get. I'm That well, makes me angry. Miller, I, I love your... Uh, your heart for victims, because I think that's the heart of the Lord. I love your heart for the weak. And I think that's like in, in the American church specifically, which is where we're located. I just think that's what's needed because the, the powerful people are the ones uh, that, that tend to get compassion from, from people uh, because they've had this life-changing ministry or whatever it is. But uh the victims are, are who we really want to focus on. So I appreciate that about you, Miller. Um, I, the other thing I think in the context of this restoration and people are like, 
you know, people are asking in the chat, well, what about Peter? Peter was restored after denying Christ. And I do think that's a really good example uh, about the he possibility just yeah. victimize he, he cursed, all these other he, people. He Can cursed I, like, the little girl. He didn't guys... sexually assault her. Like that's such a huge difference. <laughs> y'all wouldn't, wouldn't even let me finish no, this. No, no. It just makes me angry. It's not well, even. Hey, ugh. hey, okay. All right. Well, what I, what I was going to say was what, so yes, one is the sexual nature of the sin and the abusive nature of the sin, but also the duration of the deception. We're talking about four decades of deception of the global church. To me, I'm just like, um, it, what would it take to rebuild trust? Like a year of faithfulness, two years, 10 years. I mean, probably you could never trust him again because he lied for 40 and there's not enough years in anyone's lifetime when, to rebuild that kind of is trust. He, is he for a public ministry. bringing restoration? Like, is he actually uh, bringing restitution? Yes. Is he paying the counseling bills for these women who for 40 years have been holding secrets? Like, the the fact is, this rushing to restoration, it's like, where's the restitution? Rick Joyner, where's the fund to pay for the counseling bills of all of those who are still at IHOP that are so incredibly disillusioned right now and don't know what to do with all the decisions that got them where they're at? Um, sorry, I just, I keep thinking about those people. That's like, that's in my mind, uh, not necessarily Mike. And, 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 you know, gosh, I, I, I wish Mike the best in the sense that I hope he repents and finds grace for his sin. Amen. Um, but that's about as far as I feel right now for him. Um, yeah, I, I think the, uh, so this is, this is Proverbs 6, 20, uh, 32 through 33, right? He who commits adultery lacks sense. He who uh, does it destroys himself. He will get wounds and dishonor, and his disgrace will not be wiped away. Okay. Now, according to First Timothy, elders are to be above reproach. They're supposed to be well known in the community. They're supposed to be people of integrity. Um, Proverbs is telling me that this kind of sin has a disgrace with it that doesn't wipe away. Um, and again, guys, there, there, there may be another show where we talk about people who've stumbled into sexual immorality and if there is a place for them to be restored. This isn't that program. Uh, but what we're talking about is we're talking about a person who hid this from everyone around them when it came forward, denied things. Uh, and then uh, when one uh, th then admitted to what could be proven and then another victim spoke up. Right. So he's still only admitting to what he can barely admit to, to just get by, and then people will come out with more. Um, he's controlling the narrative, trying to intimidate people who are coming forward. Uh, this is not a person you want leading you. Like you need, you, we need to have some sense in this. Um, this is not that situation, no matter what it is. And there is a deep level of dishonor and shame that I don't think is going to be wiped away um, to such a way that someone could follow this individual with any measure of confidence. Um, yeah. and restoration to a pulpit and restoration to God are very different things. Very different to things. Your point, to your point, we'll have to discuss that in another episode. Uh, do we have more, uh, videos? We have four more videos, um, talking about what we okay. can learn from this. I have 20 stuff. minutes, I guess. Let's do I it. got a Patreon episode. Well, in seeing the reaction globally of the body of Christ to this, uh, it, it, I, my, I think my reason is largely because of the same reason Jane Doe, the first Jane Doe came out and why subsequent ones have, they've all said, we are doing this because we don't want others to suffer the same thing we did. You know, I've, I've got two daughters. I've got, um, um, you know, a granddaughter, um, I know so many young people in ministry and I, I, I just want to raise a red flag or a caution flag and say, look, you know, this idea of accountability, I thought Mike was accountable to us, but he wasn't. He was living a double life and it broke my heart. It did feel like betrayal. Um, I felt lied to and deceived. And I, I just wanted, I think it's important that this message gets out and that people learn from it so that they won't be caught up in the snare of this kind of behavior themselves, that they'll be alert to the fact that you have to have a genuine accountability where you can't have offices where you have deadbolts from the inside and no windows. You can't uh, hang out for hours on end with uh, young, attractive women, uh, not your wife. Uh, there's so many lessons to learn from this. But if we just hide in silence and don't say anything at all, uh, we're not going to grow from it. We're not going to learn. And we, we, we have to 
try to find some redemptive value in this kind of a scenario. It's ugly. It's unimaginably painful. It's the worst thing that I've ever walked through in my life. And yet, I think I've grown a bit from it, and I hope other people who hear these stories uh, will themselves um, say, yeah, it's a wake-up call. I, I need to look into some situations in my church or in my own life. I just don't want any other individuals to have to go through this. And I know they will. There's no way we can avoid it. But maybe we can uh, preempt some of these abusive situations where vulnerable young women are exploited. Um, that's that's my primary motivation. And also, honestly, I don't know if it'll have this effect, but I hope it would prompt Mike to really come completely clean. You know, it's one of the things I've learned in ministry is I tell people this all the time. When somebody is caught in this kind of sin, they will only confess or admit to what they think they need to to get by. And then later somebody else comes forward and then another incident is revealed. And not only does that reflect badly on that perpetrator, but it undermines his credibility. So I just want to say, gosh, hopefully Mike will just say, all right, enough's enough. I'm going to give you details of every um, incident that I had with a woman other than my wife, Diane. And uh, I just want to come completely clean and ask the Lord's forgiveness. I hope that will happen. I don't have a lot of confidence that it will, but I pray that it will. I'm discovering this is a major way that churches respond, which is to use process to negate vital truth. Right. You know, to use the process to shield them from coming to terms with the truth. And uh, Mike was able to use a global platform, a global web stream to set up a scenario of division so that when the truth would come out, there would be massive resistance to Jane Doe and what she was saying. Yeah more information begin to come in. I think as more information to become in, and to be honest, I did not respond well. I took that first Timothy 519. I'm discovering the old guard simply does not know how to respond to clergy abuse. And I would have been part of that. I was waiting in the background for another one to come forth because there has to be two accusations against the elder. And in my own mind, I'm go I look back now and I go, what was I thinking? You don't need two abuses before you confront something. But this old guard, you don't, you know, touch not the Lord's anointed, you know, say nothing in public. Don't press, you know, give them the benefit of the doubt. And there's some good safeguards in that. But I've been on a journey of coming out of my old mindsets into understanding, oh, we, we have a lot to learn on this issue. And unfortunately, the last 20 years has given us a lot of content to learn on this issue. The moment that I was thrown into this is the moment I realized that the body of Christ is not educated uh, sufficiently on this. I wasn't. I was part of the problem. And so now I'm on a learning curve to go with the breakdown of sound governance, with charismatic independent churches that are run you know, in the context of celebrity Christianity, I, we, if we can say anything right now, leadership teams have not been faithful and competent in dealing with this issue. That's why I pled at the very beginning at IHOP KC leadership, sons and daughters cannot investigate their spiritual fathers. They just can't. They weren't equipped. They failed at every point because I believe because of that issue, even the advocates we're growing through uh, pains and wrong understandings. And so I, I'm not sure, I, I'm not the one to ask. I just know that we've got to begin to learn from the last 20 to 30 years. And it's bigger than just victims coming forward. It's victims coming forward in a context of, of poor church governance, celebrity Christianity, founderism that's off the charts um, and who can help us in the old guard with old mindsets in a deficient church that needs massive, massive reform, not just revival. If you would have asked me before this, uh, Alan, does the church need revival? I would have said, yes, it needs revival. Now I'm like the church needs reform. I, I'm not even sure if revival would be safe within the context of the church in many ways of how church governance is. 
and the fragmentation and the rise of celebrity uh, pastors. I, I think uh, we are in need of not just a great move of God, a great overhaul. We're, we're almost at a moment in history right now where, where some of the codes, you, you know, the, the Billy Graham ethic for how you, how you lead and how you uh, operate as an itinerant minister, we need some, we, we almost need a code of ethics right now to rally around like the Luzon Covenant was to evangelism. We, we're, we're in need of a reform right now of some basics that we can agree upon for the next generation of pastors. We're pushing now four plus months later, they still have not agreed to a legitimate third party neutral comprehensive investigation. They've refused to do that. And the primary excuse that they've used is they've said, well, the AG didn't follow proper biblical protocol. That is a bunch of absolute complete BS. They say they didn't, the process was wrong. We're hurt by them. It again, as I said, Stewart tried to pretend like he was doing the right thing all along while refusing to do the right thing. Any excuse in the world, oh, just blame the Bible, blame the process, blame this and that. This is no different to me than the man who says the woman was raped because she was not dressed properly. Like you're talking after someone was raped, you're going to focus on how she was dressed. And, you know, it, it is impossible when you're coming against an organization like this with a deceptive false prophet leading it with a bunch of enablers under his authority. It's impossible to have done it right. It's impossible for it to have gone smoothly. The biggest mistake the AG made was trusting that Stewart and the ELT and those guys would do the right thing because they did. They look the stories that we heard about um, Stuart working behind the scenes with Mike even after he was removed and all of these things. Like there's so many stories I could tell you, and it's always hard to know whether or not they're 100% true. But it's clear that there has been absolute complicity in all of this, and and then and then the degree of complicity has, you know, it's diminished as we've gone as they've replaced the original team with other leaders. But they've replaced them with more yes men, with more people who agree with them. Stewart put in Malachi Martin. He put in, um, well, let's just say this, a handful of people who are just little Stewarts on the new board. They, they started a new board and this type of thing. But there has been a consistent effort to put all of the blame on the AG in the process while refusing to simply come out and say, we messed up. We're so sorry. We're so sorry for the pain that we inflicted on Jane Doe. We're so sorry for all the things that, no, it's just, there's, we're hurt. We did the right thing. We tried. The AG didn't do it. And, and in fairness, now here we are four months later, from what I'm told, um, Isaac Bennett and Joseph Taylor, and at least one member of the board that I'm, I'm friends with, um, Pastor Shane is an amazing yeah, uh, we man of integrity. Amazing man of integrity. Um, they are very close right now to doing the right thing, to at least agreeing to a third party investigation. The problem, and this has been my frustration from day one, is that this has been four months of allowing Mike Bickle and his behind the scenes mafia to belittle, discredit, attack whistleblowers, including the victims themselves, the hell that Jane Doe has gone through, that his minions have uh, put her through opening up fake accounts, doxing her, attacking her, releasing Mike's private emails and her emails and so forth. Mike has been working behind the scenes with some of his relatives, with internet trolls to, to basically destroy and intimidate anyone who's speaking up, myself included. You know, I, I, there's one guy named Mike Brown on Twitter who's close friends with Mike's nephew, was putting out for weeks that I called Stuart the N-word. Um, you know, literally saying they had recordings of it. I called the guy. I go, do you realize that my family is transracial? That I kiss black skin, white skin, brown skin, good night every night. And you're just throwing out anything, accusations, simply because I'm trying to do the right thing and speak out and expose a wolf and a predator. This is what everyone, and I know the whistleblower that I met with that you'll be interviewing, the hell that he has gone through. They have tried, they have called his relatives, People have had people calling their their bosses at work, trying to destroy their lives. And and Mike Bickle is very good at maintaining 
um, uh, the ability to deny everything, but it's very, very clear that the information is coming from him um, and those very close to him. And and this is what waiting this long has allowed to happen. Mm. If they had called in the third party from the very beginning, but there's been you know four months of file shredding, email deleting, witness intimidation, and this type of thing, and that's the crime behind it all. And unfortunately, mm. that's what's that's what Isaac and Joseph have inherited. And until they publicly acknowledge this and repent, um, they will not have taken responsibility for their their failure. And I want to be clear, you know, like I'm willing to give Isaac and these guys absolute grace. I wish the best for them. Isaac, God bless him. He grew up in the system. And I believe these are good people. But when you grow up under the influence of such a powerful deceiver, um, it's a it's a profound, he, he has profound power, and I'm willing to acknowledge that, but you still have to acknowledge it after the fact and say, I was yeah. deceived, I hurt people. What, one thing that I've learned is that the entire world, in many ways, and I don't mean to sound like some, you know, Joel's woke or whatever, but the whole world in many ways, historically, it's been a good old boys club um, where the weak, the powerless are oppressed, the powerful exploit those under them and and they have the megaphone and the power and this sort of thing. And I think anyone should be able to acknowledge that. But the reality is the church has been no different, if not worse at times. And this should not be in the house of God. The house of God should be a place where the weak, the marginalized, the hated, the broken, the lame, that they are championed and cared for, not crushed, not destroyed. When someone has the courage to come forward, the leader should gather around them and support them. One of the victim advocates said, you know, they go, I've walked through the Hillsong scandal. I've walked through the Willow Creek scandal, the Rabbi Zachariah scandal, et cetera, et cetera. And they said, this is the first big scandal where I have seen men, leaders stand up and defend the women. And that just broke my heart. I said, what the heck is wrong with the church? So we need to we need to acknowledge our mistakes, our failures. And the, again, the effort to protect the organization, protect our friends and not and the money and the power and the reputation and not stand up for the victims. Um, there are huge problems in particularly the charismatic movement with hero idolatry and the big platform ministers, celebrity Christianity. We need to kill that thing publicly and embrace a much more humble um, uh, approach. Again, getting back to that nameless, face, faceless, decentralized um, sort of approach that we see in the New Testament. Even Paul the Apostle was a bivocational minister sewing tents and leather or whatever he was doing. Um, there's so much hype and sensationalism in this world that we need to kill. And um, you know, like I could go on and on. These are things that I'm I'm receiving in my own heart and applying to my own life and ministry, but that initially it was it was it was about it was about Mike. Now, yes, other things have been turned up about I hope and the culture, which obviously, um, when you find out that uh, somebody who's been a friend and a leader in your in your life has got this much but much larger, darker side than you were aware of, it's it's number one shocking. It's it's head spinning. It's a, you know, you almost have emotional whiplash of like, this is not the person that I thought I knew. Um, but the, the hope is for, 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 I hope is like, Hey, we're in a heartbreaking situation. Let's just, let's just follow biblical principles. And, and when I say this, I mean, there's, there's this whole kind of, there's a lot of learning that, that's come out of this. I mean, what, one of the facts that obviously is, is, become known amongst lots of churches where abuse is happening that Matthew 18, this Matthew 18 process is, is often um, weaponized. But for me, this is kind of pharisaical, like looking at like this process to overlook the bigger issues of justice. Um, and for me, it's like, let's, let's go up to that, that higher law of love that Jesus commands us and walk through with mourning and, pain and like let's let's try to do the righteous thing um for me i, I mean there's lots of learnings in this I, one of the things which has been a little harder is older saints that i've looked up to have been like you know it's it's tragic the way that this is so public you know you've got to just leave it to the sovereignty of the lord 
And it's just like when, when I hear wrongdoing happening in my basement and I don't open the door and go down and investigate what's going on, I, I, I feel complicit if, I, if I'm not a part of the solution because I feel that the Lord calls us to righteousness to, to, as shepherds to make sure that people aren't uh, being harmed, sexually harmed, uh, emotionally, physically harmed. And so um, I, I felt a, a responsibility as a, as a, as a person who was a, in the leadership position to actually see that the wrong things are, are made right. So yeah, one of the first weeks, Hey, um, we've got to wrap this up. So I'm super thankful. There's a lot to learn from that, glean from that round tree. I want to give you the opportunity to speak first. Um, you are doing a scheduled live Q and a over on Patreon here in a hot second. So I'm going to toss it over to you for some, some closing thoughts. Some of your takeaways, like what is it that you think this moment, this event provides us as charismatic movement, Christianity in general, that we need to see corrected and changed? Um, you know, Sam talked a lot about, uh, accountability and how he was in this small group with Bickle and he thought Bickle was accountable, but Bickle wasn't because the thing is, here's what I've learned about accountability. You're only as accountable as you want to be. And I think that, uh, that when it comes to accountability, I think a lot of times we put like our primary emphasis on holiness and praise God, be holy for I'm holy. That's, that's a huge deal, but people can fake holiness. What I would say is what if we put a higher priority, even this sounds like crazy to say, but even a higher priority than, than holiness of light, because the thing is light purifies unholiness. And by light, I'm talking about, first of all, if you walk in the light as he's in the light and the blood of his son, Jesus purifies us from all sin and we have fellowship with one another. So, so it purifies us when we walk in the light, what the sins that we commit while in the light, and it's the light of transparency. It's the light of honesty, of authenticity. And, and so, you know, like you two guys on this podcast with me know every single secret and every single sin I've committed in, uh, I don't know, like the last few years. I mean, like I, I tell you everything and I have a few friends locally that I do the same with. And, uh, and then publicly I want to be authentic to never ever tell lies and to just be who I am and let my, my conduct outwardly match my character inwardly. So, so that's the holiness part, but I can't uphold a holy lifestyle if I am not passionately pursuing the light. And, and, and that looks like the, the authenticity that I talked about, but then in some circumstances such as this, it even goes over into exposure, Ephesians 5, 11, unrepentant sin addressed in private ultimately must become public. So there's more to, uh, more to say, but I think uh, that's a big one. I'd love for one of you guys to touch on process negating truth coming out. I think that was, uh, that was a big one. Yeah, I want Miller to take a stab at it. Roundtree, you heading out? Uh, yeah, I could head out. So when, I'm, when I is, got that five the Q &A Patreon, start? but my, my Patreon, our Patreon viewers are probably in this and want to finish it. So let's sure. just tie it up here soon. Sounds good. Miller. Yeah. So Roundtree, when you say negating truth, do you mean like hushing over it? What do you, what did you mean by that? Well, where whistleblowers and witnesses are, uh, are crushed. Victims are crushed because maybe they didn't go through a process in a perfect way. Maybe like, well, why are they telling those couples and they haven't done like process matters. It definitely matters, but like it's straining out the gnat and swallowing the camel where powerful people say you didn't dot the I's and cross the T's. So I'm going to ignore sexual abuse. Whoa, whoa. Okay. The, the I's and T's matter. Let's care about, I mean, process matters, but like, let's, let's not, turn a blind eye to sexual abuse into the cry of victims because somebody didn't do everything perfectly. And if you are a victim, I mean, let's get real. You're not going to walk it out perfectly because you, you've been bleeding inside and you're probably going to have some real emotional reactions and your, your tone isn't going to be perfect, right? Like, like if you're a victim, your, your bleeding is going to come out and it's just not going to be pretty. And for somebody to, to castigate a victim over that, it's just like, don't strain out the gnat and swallow the camel. That's what Jesus says Pharisees do. So 
I, I guess I might have taken your talking point, Miller. <laughs> no, nah, you're fine. I think uh, I'll add something to this. Usually what happens when a whistleblower comes forward is, I mentioned this earlier, the ad hominem arguments. I think what's sad is is I found that when it comes to the um, sexual abuse stuff happening at IHOP, the world took note of it and the world paid uh, way more attention to the accusations and was able to more clearly see the faults of the ELT from the very get-go. Um, sadly, though, uh, sexual abuse is not the only kind of abuse that is often being brought to the uh, leadership. And uh, when it's not sexual abuse, they're far less likely to listen to it if it isn't perfectly followed out in that Matthew 18 way or the way that those leaders have prescribed for the members of their church, which is why, again, you have to have some sort of whistleblower policy at your church, uh, which is something we're actually talking in our membership meeting this Sunday. We're actually uh, presenting our whistleblower policy to my my community here. Um, but I think that, yeah, the thing that really is, is frustrating to me is how um, when certain kinds of abuse that aren't sexual in nature get brought forward and those people get gaslit, discredited, ad hominem arguments like they're just bitter and wounded, start getting thrown out. People fail to look at the facts. What did they accuse? What, what was the accusation? Is there any truth to this accusation? Is there any proof that this accusation shows some uh, uh, credibility? Um, it, and are there others that have experienced likewise? And usually that, that is just never the question asked. If you, didn't, if you didn't bring it up the way they prescribed, you're automatically discounted. So like I know so many stories of people who, let's just take my past church, so many stories of people that brought an accusation or a concern uh, to the main leader, uh, the one who uh, fired me, um, brought accusations to him. And his response was, you're dishonoring that person. If you have a problem, you have to go directly to them in Matthew 18 fashion. So what happens is these people say, hey, um, I'm coming to my pastor. Uh, this person is a wolf. And the pastor responds by saying, now I'm going to feed you to the wolf. That is the worst act of abuse. And that is often what's happening. Um, at, at IHOP in particular, a woman was told that she had to go and confront directly her rapist. Like, hello, this is where your processes have actually failed those victims. And I would ask them, what does it look like to make restitution to that victim? Pay for her counseling. Uh, hold that person accountable. Remove them from ministry. Uh, ask the victim. It's a great question to ask. What can I do to make this right? What does restitution look like in this situation? And that has been a massive failure. And it's something I think we are learning about the church as a whole. I have a friend who was at a, a very well-known ministry down in Florida. Uh, he was fired. He was abused. And then when he brought it up to another major leader in the body of Christ, that major leader immediately said, mm, man, you never go public. You, you never talk about these things. Uh, yeah, you just you just need to get over that. You're just bitter and wounded. And again, it's like, don't look at the facts. Just look at this bitter, wounded person. Something else I need to make mention of is oftentimes when people come forward with an accusation, they're usually experiencing some form of post-traumatic stress disorder. So they're showing the symptoms of being unstable because they're actually traumatized. And um, oftentimes leaders have no idea how to deal with somebody in that wounded state. And because their behavior and approach is often somewhat unfamiliar and seems unstable, it immediately causes you to question that person and whether or not they're telling the truth. And again, I would say if love believes all things, it needs to believe even a person who's showing the signs of being unstable, uh, it should still believe that they're telling you the truth when they bring it forward. So mm -hmm. sorry, that's a whole lot of information. No, I, I would just say we, this is something that we're, we're, we're we've talked about. It's in some of the extended, you know, uh, cuts where we're talking about things that you should do. If you're in a situation, talk to a licensed counselor. Go talk to a counselor. If it's criminal activity, uh, if you were or are a minor, go speak to the police as soon as possible. Um, make sure that you're getting counsel on how to address this. Um, come forward, be brave, so that other people don't have to go through it. I would very much encourage if you're a pastor 
you don't know what you're like how to walk through something like this you need to pick up books like a church called the tove you need to pick up um a bully pulpit by uh Michael Kruger. Um, I, I think if you had to pick between the two, pick up Bully Pulpit. It's very good. Um, and uh, guys, I, I think this has just created some kind of self-awareness. I think in the movement, we need to be praying through this stuff. We need to be addressing it. Uh, we need to have policies in place on the front end, not on the back end, trying to figure it out and putting things together in the air. Um, so uh, a couple of comments uh, in the, you know, uh, I, I talked about Patreon. Some people are asking about Michael Roundtree. What's he doing on Patreon? Are we just continuing this conversation? No. Michael's doing a live Q&A on, on theology. Uh, so it is not going to be related to this discussion. Uh, we'll be fielding just questions from people who support the ministry. It has nothing to do uh, with our discussion today. Um, but then also, um, I mentioned that these extended interviews, all, the totality of the interviews can be found on Patreon at around 7 p.m. today. Um, some people seemed to be upset that we were holding them behind a paywall. I, I would say, honestly, I believe we've given the, the, the full synopsis of that content. We haven't withheld anything that's like secretive or extra behind a paywall uh, in any way. Uh, we just decided to put all of those up there as a way to just archive them. And then people who may be interested can watch them. But I would say uh, the gist of the videos, the meat of the videos, you've already seen. You already have access to Oh, no, to. You, you got it all. So, I was in all of those interviews. So you yeah. got the bulk of what was there. Yeah, so, so this it, is not a motivation to get over to Patreon. Hundred percent. I'm just saying this is a place that we've archived it and we've placed it. You're not missing out on anything, but we want you to know if you want to watch it, that's where they're at. Uh, <clears throat> uh, check out those books. Check out that content. Uh, I I know we've got to wrap this up right now. So, um, guys, uh, let's let's pray for victims and um, what how God would restore something um, in that community. Yeah. So, um, Father, we thank you. Uh, for all the great things that you have done um, in Kansas City yeah. uh, and the, the lives that you have saved, the families that are together, the marriages uh, that didn't divorce because of the things you did in Kansas City, uh, the people that you healed, uh, the words of direction that you gave. We thank you uh, so much for all of your good works amongst your people. Uh, Lord, um, the people of God are grieved by the evil that has been taking place underneath the guise of shepherding um, that wolves have snuck in unannounced to prey on the flock of God. And, and Lord, many have been wounded and hurt and brutalized. And Lord, we ask in the name of Jesus that you would heal and comfort um, and correct. Continue to expose all of the sin that is hidden in that uh, space, in the community. Lord, we ask that you would be merciful um, to Mike uh, and to those who have had, held things um, under wraps, who didn't speak out, who didn't get things corrected, who didn't go forward, um, but those who uh, gaslit, those who um, pretend this was not an issue, would you show them mercy? Lord, I know that the wrath of God abides on people who do not repent for this kind of thing. So, Lord, we ask that you would be merciful, um, and Lord, that you would give immense wisdom to the current ELT, as many of them have cycled off and new people are there, to bring justice to this situation and to vindicate victims, to care for the actual uh, people who are in pain, who is the victims, who are the victims and their families, to care for them and to bring real restitution to this situation. Lord, we pray for a legitimate, impartial third-party investigation to bring dark things to light. Um, yeah. And Lord, that you would grant repentance to all parties um, uh, who have, again, caused this pain. Um, yeah. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, uh, I, that's it. Hugs and kisses. We'll see you next time. Hopefully it won't be this bleak. Um, yeah. Peace.